we're just going to go over general SCADA information here this morning. Kind of a uh, specifications that you'd look like to look at to really identify what you want in a SCADA system. It's really to pique your interests and uh, guide you in some of these questions. Um, and then we're going to look at the components that are in a typical SCADA system. It's very high level stuff. If you have any questions, you want to save until the end, that'd be great. And uh, we're going to be going, I think we're, what, 8 to 9 is the time frame on this one? Okay. I can be wordy, so I'll try not to talk too much. All right, so uh, this is the primarily the function of SCADA, situational awareness. This is kind of a new term that people are bandying about, um, but really it's been around for a long, long time. And I'm doing a presentation later today specifically about this topic. But I thought it was uh, good time to throw this in here. It's, it's really intended to enunciate alarms, graphically represent your information, uh, calculations and such, provide historical information for contextual use. Okay, You'll notice that I didn't use the term data there. It's because data is by itself not that functional. Information is valuable. So I'm going to bring this up here. I happen to not be able to look at my computer while I'm doing this. So I'm going to try to bring this up so you can see it. Here's a graphical overview of a process. Really simplified. I've got it a little bit off there on the resolution wise. But the idea behind this is that it gives you a lot of context about your information. You've got your, your data point here, just the data itself. And then you have the information that gives you context, your low level uh, sorry, your, your low and high range. You've got your operational range in blue. And you've got this uh, trend leaving behind. It's actually called a, uh, a uh, spark line or pigtail. It gets all kinds of crazy names. But the idea is that it gives you context to use to identify when anomalous conditions are going to happen. You can see here on the, uh, on the far left-hand side that you've got a value that's about to go outside its operational range, or at least it looks like it might. So it's something to be aware of. So we want to get away from the use of the terms data and move towards information. And it's all about helping you make appropriate decisions, which is the whole reason why you have SCADA to start with. Okay. So we're looking at requirements and then components. And look at the requirements group first. Operationally, what we want to do is make this thing as functional as possible from an operational standpoint. And there's lots of other things that it can do, but this is, again, the primary function for it. So we'll look at the operational requirements. OK, so we have the information required for the operational continuity. We have the consequences of system downtime. So what do you want to ensure? Uh, you want to ensure that the system runs. You want to ensure that if the SCADA software goes down, that the system by itself will be able to continue operations, be completely autonomous. Okay? You don't want to rely on any one piece of it and have a, a system that doesn't have fault tolerance built in. You want to know what their alarm conditions are. This is a big one. Um, alarm conditions typically get set in whole, en masse. You end up with a ton of alarms, and it's so overwhelming to the operational group that they really can't find what's valuable in there. So being able to identify what alarms make sense, bring it down to the absolute essentials, and prioritize those. So when you do get your flood of alarms, which at some point is going to happen, you, you look at only the ones that are the highest priority first, and then you move down from there. Okay, The relative priorities is incredibly important. Control, data access. Who's going to access the data? And when are you going to be manned and unmanned? And therefore, if you're on band, you've got to have something that's able to uh, look at a, uh, send out alarm notifications, for example. Okay. These are three additional categories. Or, uh, yeah. You got the maintenance uh, data to diagnose alarm conditions. So, what are you going to look at when an, when an alarm condition happens? That becomes your trending information and such. Okay, maybe ancillary information, like I'm looking at a value and I want to see what the values around it that affect that process are. So I wanted the ability to trend values that are associated in groups. Okay. Data for preventive maintenance, runtime hours, pump starts. If we can use that information and generate alarm conditions, or not alarms, but um, low priority warnings, if you will, 
when something gets to the point where it needs to be maintained, it's helpful. And we've already got that information, so we can give it right to you. I shouldn't say we. Your SCADA system does. It's the royal we. Um, regulatory information, data for reporting. The length of your data storage is going to be key. How long are you required to maintain your reportable records? So in some industries, that could be a year. In some industries, that could be five. It could be essentially as long as you've got uh, the space to hold it, you're required to hold it. IT, security, cybersecurity. Everything else is kind of not that important, but cybersecurity and security, I got a slide later that gets into that. And that's become a major, uh, a major factor in the development of the systems. Okay, I'm not going to get too much into that because I will touch on it later. Management oversight. This is, this is becoming much more of interest rather than just simply an operational system. Where are we going in the future? What are we planning on doing? Are we going to have multiple systems tie them together? Centralized data access? Uh, where's the future plans of the system go? How do you plan for growth for that? Do you buy a system that's only capable of a certain amount of capabilities when you, or a certain level of growth, when you know you're going to grow well beyond that? I'm in Texas and there's not a utility in Texas that is not currently going through growth. It's, it's absolutely amazing to me. So always a major factor there. You see, by the way, down the corner, that's your goals right there. That's a hockey goal. That's the only type of goal that's important, by the way, Canadian. Okay, uh, configuration change capture, version controlling, being able to tell what your system is about, and supportability, maintaining it, uh, looking for efficiency enhancements over time. Okay, all these things are part of the SCADA system, but none of them are key other than the operational parts. So we're going to look at the SCADA components next, the parts that make this up. And there's really five different categories. There's the instrumentation, which is actually a category over on this side. This is the first part of it where we're actually uh, picking up our values that we want to monitor, switches we want to close, things like that. Um, we're not going to touch on that. There's a variety of different parts, and I'm considering that part of the process, okay. which it may or may not be. Okay, so we're going to look first at the field devices. And with the field devices, what we're looking at here is the components that collectively, they collaborate to meet the requirements that we've just put forth. Okay, and when I say that, what you're going to see is that there's um, some components can be changed, or if you cer pick a certain technology, you have to pick a different technology for your, say, protocol. If you pick a certain one for your, uh, for your communications link. They work collaboratively in order to get you what you want as far as your uh, requirements go. Kay. Newer technology has really enabled some interesting stuff, in particular with the, the IIoT world. We're seeing a huge change in how people are thinking about bringing data in and what data is being brought into systems. Kay. It's, it's been around a long time. IIoT has been around since 99, the concept of it. But now, all of a sudden, it's actually being utilized. I set my first system up this week with one of our customers in Louisiana, uh, not too far from these guys. Um, this is Jefferson Parish. We're now pulling in some data for additional water monitoring equipment. Kay. So let's look at the field devices. Okay, so what is a field device? It's essentially a hardened piece of gear that's used to monitor and or control your assets that are out in the field, okay? And it sends and receives signals from the instrumentation, temperature, pressure, flow, your switches, whatever it happens to be, your level detection. It's getting that information. Typically, it's transferring it. Sometimes it does the control features. I.O. boards. We used to see a lot of this kind of stuff. We still see a little bit. And actually, if you look back, back at the IOT concept, we're really back to a pure information coming in type of a status with most of these devices. There's not a whole lot of information going out with them. Uh, they're meant to pick up specific points. This is what the IOT or the I.O. boards were used for back in the 1980s, back in the 1970s. You know, when this whole thing first started, you get your data in, you get in raw data. And you get your PLC programming, uh, your PLCs. And there's also one there called a PAC. 
So the PLC itself, Programmable Logic Controller, this is meant to be the primary control for your system. It defines what your system does, how it affects those variables that it's getting in, the instrumentation, and how it controls the process. It's, uh, they vary greatly in their capabilities. Some are really capable, some are just not that capable. They vary greatly in how they're programmed. The programmable automation controller is a kind of a step beyond that where it includes some additional features that give you additional control. It gives you really advanced analysis and things within the actual controller itself. There's one that we use in the oil and gas industry. It's very common. It's called a flow computer. That takes the information in and it does automatic calculations on the flow that is happening there. That flow information is then used for regulatory purposes. And so that's a really advanced uh, automation controller, if you will. That's uh, calculation controller. Yeah. These are for remote assets. So the other ones are wired, typically. The ones that are remote uh, are to use. That's the general term for them, remote telemetry unit or remote terminal unit. Same acronym essentially means the same thing. Everyone disagrees on which one they want to use. Okay, the RTU is generally a term used in the top for monitoring assets remotely, doing localized control, bringing in that information. When you get to the, the other RTU, what they're saying there is a much more advanced level of control on site, almost like the, the PLC pack type concept, except this one doesn't change the name. Okay. Data loggers. You see these in a lot of, um, and they're kind of outside the realm of SCADA so much, but they are data, uh, data gathering. We do bring data into the systems. Happens a lot in places like Florida where you're uh, doing like water quality monitoring or uh, level monitoring over time, you'll bring data in for a period of a day. But you won't bring it in regularly. You'll only communicate with this thing once every 24 hours and then you get a flush of all the data that was within the system. Um, some also have the capability of not only communicating in real time, but if they lose that communication link, then they can log the data within the device itself. And when you reestablish that connection, it flushes all the data out and brings it down. And what did I put in there? Smart sensors. So really, again, what we're doing here is just adding a line in for the IIoT stuff. I didn't typically have that in here, but now some of these sensors, are, well not some, a ton of these sensors are out there and that data is coming in. So that is yet another type of remote access to the data. Okay, so the communication link here, what is a communication link? And it is typically a connection for data flow between your devices and your mon monitoring facility. That is what it is. It's intended to be, basically it's a language that you would speak. Uh, or it's a connection of which you would send your language information across. Could be hardwired or wireless, but the type of, um, type of network and type of connectivity that you're going to use depends largely on what your goals are, what you've set for your requirements for your system, and what the limitations of it are as well. So if I look at those limitations, they're distance from the monitoring facility. If I'm using radio, I can't go 40 miles away. I probably could, but repeater, repeater, repeater where it's much easier to just go with, say, a cellular device to pull in that data set. Topology, again, radio's cheaper over the long term because I'm not paying a monthly fee. But if I've got mountains in the way, it could be a real problem for me to put in repeaters to go across mountains. And the frequency of the data transfer. If I'm using cellular and I'm paying so much per month based on usage, and all of a sudden I want oh, five-second data, I could be paying an astronomical amount to pull in data across a cellular modem. And then the last one, the cost of data transfer, which is also part of the cell modem in most cases. Okay. That's usually the limiting factor there. Okay, these are the hardwired type connections that you run into. I'll just bring them all up there. Oh, sorry. Okay, so you have point to point connectivity. Uh, your single hardwired type of COM port, we used to see this a lot. In fact, I'm dealing with one right now in Texas. And we used to see it on the old school modems as well, dial-up type modems. I've still got a couple of utilities that are using a lot of modems. 70 remote facilities all using modems, probably paying $600 a month per line. But yeah, 
It's insane. Yeah. So it used to be five bucks a month for a phone line. Now it's like six hundred dollars a month because they don't want you using them and they don't want to maintain them. Yeah. I'm sorry, AT and T. Wherever you are, they're listening. I know they're listening. Um, Ethernet, intranet. That'd be your internal network or your intranet. So going out to pull data across it. Uh, you get multi-drop type systems, RS-485. That's kind of a, like a daisy chain. One connects to the next, to connects to the next, connects to the next. That's a st kind of a legacy communication method, but we still see it a fair bit. And then you get dedicated control networks. Again, more legacy type stuff, but um, we're still seeing a lot of it out there. We still have to adjust for that. So, I, the cool thing about SCADA is that it can communicate with all kinds of different things, right? The tough thing about SCADA is that it has to communicate with all kinds of different things. So we constantly have to maintain whatever we have and then expand it to include whatever's coming up. Okay, there's no dump and move on. This is where I just, oh yeah, these were the wireless types. Radio, get back into your modem kind of concept here. Wireless Ethernet, you got your cellular Ethernet modems, very common now. A lot of cell out there being used to bring things in as the cost of monthly cellular use has gone down. And then you've got your satellite connections. We rarely see these. If we're doing things with, say, uh, offshore or uh, you've got ships that are up in the Arctic somewhere, we may be doing comms to those, um, icebreakers, that type stuff. This is the next piece. So now you got your device out in the field. You got your link that you're using to connect. The next piece is the comm driver. And I like to uh, say it's analogous to a language. Each device typically talks a language, and we talk that language to it. But in order to do that, we've got to have the ability to talk a whole bunch of different languages because for some reason, everyone wants to talk a different one. Right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, there are some common ones out there. There's a lot of common ones. And then there's a lot of common ones that are not so common. So categories they fit into, they're solicited, which is initiated by the computer itself. The computer talks out to the device in the field. Hopefully the device talks back, by the way. Um, unsolicited, which is where you don't talk to the device in the field. You wait for it to talk to you. And then you've got advanced. They could be solicited plus unsolicited plus all kinds of other cool stuff that some of these protocols can do, which is why you tend to have so many of them. So we'll look at a few of them here. This is the solicited type of protocol. You see on the bottom, it's a poll response type. I don't know if this thing keeps dropping on me. Um, it's a poll response type. We poll, see, we, again, equating myself with a computer. Um, as the computer, you pull the device in the field, the device comes back to you and says, here's your data, okay, hopefully. A couple of examples there we're quite familiar with. We've seen Modbus constantly used. Ethernet IP is a very common one used for Allen Bradley type gear. Um, Siemens, GE, Omron, all the big names, they tend to have a polling type protocol, at least some form. The problems with these is, this has got some good pros, they very simple good for uh, direct for shared comm type networks. If I get a radio, I'm going to talk to this one, I'm going to wait till it talks back to me, and then I'm going to talk to this one, and wait till it talks back. And So it works really well on a shared radio system, which is, I, I think, what you have Baton Rouge, right? You have a shared radio system. Okay. Where, um, <coughs> where it seems to fall down, though, is that the same data set is constantly requested. So if I'm talking and I say, Dan, what's your name? And you go, it's Dan. And I go, great. What's your name again? Dan. What did you say your name was again? And I keep saying that to Dan over and over and over again. Dan just keeps telling me it's Dan. Eventually, he tells me it's Sue. Okay? Things have changed. Um, a boy named Sue. There you go, right? So that's poll response type setup. I just keep asking for the same thing. I don't really care if it changes. I'm going to record it whether or not it changed. Okay? That can be very expensive on costed links if I get a cellular device. So that's when we start looking at things like unsolicited, unsolicited communication links. Okay, it works really well on costed type things. And it's this kind of a setup at the bottom. Here's some examples. CAN bus. CAN bus just feeds you data. has a stream of data that comes through. 
Some versions do. And they just send data out. You read the data stream. You get the latest version of the data. Um, MQTT and OPC, they're your IIoT type protocols. They're extremely efficient. Very, very efficient. They're really good for that. So when you're serving data up, you configure this thing and you say, send your data on change, which is what it's about. Send your data on alarms. And uh, you're actually sending it in those cases to what's called a broker. The broker sits there, waits for the data to happen, and then it says, who's interested in the data? Dan's interested, Mike's interested. Okay, I'm gonna send it to Dan. Oh, Mike doesn't want that piece of data, so I won't send it to him. But they both want this piece of data, so I'll send that to both of them. Okay, that's how an IIoT type of a communication link works. I can have any number of consumers or subscribers, they're called, and I can be a producer for the data out in the field. Okay, so they're very efficient. Here's one of the, pro the cons with them. Okay, if you've got comm links, like a serial comm link, <coughs> and you try to talk unsolicited, and the three of us decide we're all gonna talk at the same time, you just hear garbled messages. So unless you've got something that's smart enough to say, ah, well, hold on now, someone's talking, I'm gonna wait, and then hope that the other ones talk before you start talking again, then you really have a nightmare of a comm system. Okay, we've had systems using uh, DMP3, which is a very common protocol, extremely capable. On Serial, where we've had hundreds of RTUs at the same time trying to talk. No one gets any information through, and then you have to set back off rates. So each one tries slightly different uh, from the other ones. They back off a quarter second. This one backs off a third of a second, this one. And it's, it's terrible to try to organize. Then you've got your advanced protocols. And I put, um, I just mentioned DNP3. I put DNP3 into that category because it's got a ton of really good features. Extremely good features. IEC is another one. So these are very advanced. They do, they have the ability to do uh, your polling. They have the ability to do what's called an integrity poll, which says, give me everything. Tell me everything that you have. The thing comes back and goes, barfs it all up for you. There you go. Here's my whole data set. And then I say, okay, great. Now just tell me when anything's changed. And an hour later, I go back to it and I say, give me everything again. Just in case you haven't talked, I want to make sure you're still there. Because right, if thing goes away, I don't know it until I ask for data again. So I'm actually going to show you that. If I can get my, get my application to run here. Okay, so this is a typical type of a protocol driver here. Here's a real simple one, Modbus. Okay, with Modbus, I'm setting up my comms. I set up my serial communication to it, and I say, there you go, I'm done. Now I just have to say, I'm, I'm completely connected, and here's the values I want to read back. It's as easy as that. Like you can have this thing set up and communicating in a couple of minutes. Now let's look at something like DMP3. Okay, there's my connection. Okay, so this is where I set up my connection going out. I then set up what's called a listener. So I set up waiting for incoming connections. And then I go to here. And I set up how I want those incoming connections to work. Okay, and then finally I go to over here and I say, this is all the data sets I want. This is the frequency I want to check and make sure the link is still there. <coughs> so there's a huge number of settings you can set. You can get minimal settings on this, but you can really do some advanced stuff with it. You can also program some of your RTUs and then send the program down to the device in the field through the same protocol. Extremely capable. So rather than boring you with all that excitement, This is some of the things. Very feature rich, very efficient. Okay. Can be very complex. So let's look at the computers and the networking for an application as well. Okay, so when we start looking at SCADA computer network, what we're looking at is secure and high reliability. These are the two primary features of the network itself. What do we want? We want something that's never going to go down, hopefully, 
or if there's an issue, it's fault tolerant enough to self heal okay, and keep moving on. So the network configurations vary greatly. You got con criticality of the system is key. I may have a system where if it goes down for a day, no one really cares. They just want that data and they'll go back and get it when it's, when it's okay. Um, that's typical of a lot of oil and gas systems. The systems gather their data in the field and then they start it up, they pull all the data in and then they use it for reporting. But a lot of times they're not using it for critical alarms. Utilities, critical alarms are key. <coughs> that's what they're monitoring for, anomalous conditions. Number of users defines how many licenses, how many uh, connections into the server, how many computers are going to be required. The remote assets that are being required, how many RTUs are required to connect in, and therefore how many modems and other things you're going to have to have in your network. Okay. And integration with other networks. So if I might have data that I want to send over to another facility, maybe to another software, I want that software to have a connection on my network. Now I've got a lot more infrastructure. But it's critical that we do it, so we figure out how to work our way through that stuff. Getting back to cybersecurity again. Okay, so here's some of the key elements that are in there. You got your servers. They manage the major pieces of this. When we say server in a SCADA network, that's not necessarily a SCADA server. Sorry. It is a SCADA server from a software point of view, but it's not necessarily a hardware server. Okay, you can run things on a workstation or such. Okay. So those terms are kind of ambiguous in that way. They do get mixed up. Operator workstation, same thing. You could run it on any any um, workstation, you can run it on any thin client or whatever it happens to be, it doesn't matter. You can get there. Okay. Engineering workstations, they tend to be where you're doing all of your configuration. You got your remote access. So this is where we tend to have a lot of utilities that are looking at systems from outside. They'll have unmanned time, which is really, really common in the industry. And the on-manned time is then kind of offset by people having thin client access. They can access it from their phones. They can access it from tablets, from home. Very, very common. So again, it comes back to cybersecurity. And then you get local HMIs. So uh, looking at, there's a major utility in, say, northern Texas, and they're looking at putting HMIs at each one of their pump stations. An HMI being a human machine interface, and it is going to be a local interface to their PLCs that's capable of doing the full control, or sorry, the full monitoring of the system, capable of logging all their data, capable of managing all their alarms. At the central, central control facility, monitoring facility, they're also going to be able to pull all the data from all of those HMIs. They make a change to the graphics, all those graphical changes get sent out to all the HMIs in the field. So this gives you a fully centralized system. It's also distributed. What it also does, it gives you a level of redundancy. So primarily, comms are from the central. It's pulling all the data in from the RTUs and PLCs that are in the various facilities. But if for some reason that central goes away, all of the HMIs take over and they're now running all the facilities as if they were fully functional, no issues, no hiccups. Anyone can go to any facility and run. Okay. When the central computer comes back or the network, everything just resynchronizes. So it takes over again. Okay. So that's a nice fault tolerant type network. It has a lot of these pieces involved. Okay. So this is a very simple system. Really simple. Very common. <coughs> you got a single computer doing everything. Okay, and then you've got a alarm notification piece that's sending out your alarms, and uh, that's emailing, texting, whatever it happens to be. And then you've got thin clients, so people remotely can come in and take a look at what's happening. Okay. And I've been very minimal on the amount of graphics I included in there, just so it doesn't throw in all kinds of different questions. If you have any questions about it, I'm not that guy. Okay, um, then you've got a redundant server system. So you've got two computers that are both capable of being the primary functioning part of that, doing all the application control, servicing clients, doing the alarm notification, everything. You've got full redundancy. You lose one of the computers, it ends up in 
floods are very common where I am. You put one at one facility, you put another one at another facility. One facility gets flooded out, you're good. You continue taking, uh, you continue monitoring from the other location. Yeah. All remote, uh, all data is synchronized on both sides, so you never lose any data. Then you get these kind of um, these high reliability systems that are also enterprise wide. So you take what we just had, you make them part of a larger facility, and now you take multiple plants. It's very common. You'll have multiple plants all running similar looking systems with similar components, and they're all connected in this one network. Then we add a layer on top of that, which is actually called a master app. The master app, and I'm sure there's a presentation about it here somewhere, um, the master app has the ability to look at all of those plants at once. And you look at one application, you can see all the data from all your facilities. Okay. <coughs> I think it's what we're talking about with you guys down at Baton Rouge, right? Yeah. Okay. IT components, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of these, but I wanted to include them in case anyone's looking at this presentation later. The IT components are absolutely essential. Uh, typically, they're done by an IT group. Uh, they can be, it can be very complicated to set up this kind of stuff and to do it right, to do it securely, which is, again, I keep using that term, but it's everywhere now. So these are the primary components that make up the back end of a system. It's kind of the, the stuff that holds it all together that we never know enough about. Thankfully, someone does. So we're going to look at the SCADA software. This is the fifth component. So now we've built our uh, hardware out there in a the field that's controlling everything. We've got our network that gives us the capability to bring the data back. We've got the language that we're speaking to all of the devices in the field. And now we've got our data coming back. Our network is set up. <coughs> Sorry, we have uh, multiple computers that are all monitoring the equipment. Now we are connected to the equipment. Our whole network is ready to go. And now we need something to uh, be able to handle all of this process. Okay, bring it all together, make it one cohesive piece. So this is where you get to us, what VT SCADA is. So all those other things are not what we do. This is what we do. Um, so this is a full set of the general functions that we would expect to see in most SCADA systems. Now, when I say what you should see, there's a couple of pieces there that you won't see anywhere else, and one of them is the version control in particular. Okay, the thin clients are a little, or the mobile clients and internet clients are there available in some systems, but in particular, the version control is not. Okay, what this allows you to do is to include a change management piece directly into your system. You make a change, it's all recorded. We call it the blame button. Um, everybody knows exactly what you did, when you did, what you did. They don't know why you did it, unless you make a good note on it. But uh, they'll know how to reverse it if you made a big mistake. And thankfully, none of us make mistakes, so that's good. But uh, I've seen them happen before. Yeah. So. Uh, Actually, I should probably touch on that. I'm not going to get into too much depth on this thing, but I did want to show you. You've probably seen VT Skater so many times this week already, and you will see tomorrow as or today as the presentations go on. So I I'm not going to really get into all the details there. I'm going to just skim over that and mention that they're all there. And uh, some of you have taken training courses on it. You know the pieces. And this is really, again, very high-level type stuff. So the SCADA software components, mentioned the hardware components. So you have a, a, a SCADA server, and it's a piece of hardware. But you also have a SCADA server that's a piece of software. And they might be two completely different things. The term SCADA software usually gets associated with the hardware, even though it's really a server. Okay, It's a computer server. And it's often called VT SCADA Server 1, believe it or not, or VT SCADA Server 2. Application servers, these are the ones that service all of the underlying pieces, all the, all the underpinnings of the VT SCADA architecture, the ones that take in all the, the data, they manage it all, they determine who's going to get all of the data when it's requested, they ensure that everyone has got exactly the same information across the whole system. Kay. Then you've got your alarms management server. Kay. This is key to ensuring that 
if you've got multiple locations that are all handling an alarm, the moment they see that alarm is the same for all. They're all seeing the exact same alarm. The moment they uh, hit the acknowledge button, that it alarm is acknowledged in all facilities at exactly the same time. So you don't end up with two people who try to acknowledge the alarm, and you end up with two records saying that Bob did it, Dave did it, Mike did it. No? Yeah. 840. 840, okay. All right. Configuration management. So this is your uh, server that handles the configuration, as I was talking about. You can have multiple of all of these for redundant servers. Get your driver servers, your historian. <coughs> the historian is typically set up as a separate computer in a lot of systems. We don't necessarily do that. We include the server, the historian feature as a base feature in every single license. The benefit of that is that you can easily just install two licenses, make them fully redundant to one another, have historians on both computers, and they're fully synchronized in real time without all of the additional infrastructure, hardware, and networking required. You can have that if you want, but you don't need it. Alarm notification, also a separate piece, usually requires a dialer or some piece of software, usually from some third party. And then there's interfaces with third party software. So a lot of utilities now, a lot of our customers in particular, um, in oil and gas in particular, are taking data and sharing that data with external uh, software systems or taking data from third-party software systems and bringing it into VT SCADA. So this internet connectivity is key. And then on the client side, it's a very limited set of functions. You got your, obviously, your operational activities is the primary function there. You've got your system configuration. It goes back to your engineering workstations. And then you've got your data analysis and reporting. So what does the future hold for all this stuff? Basically, everything's getting better on a really regular basis. The amount of technology that, that's changing overnight is um, amazing. So as a result, we have enhancements in every single one of these fields. So I guarantee you, by the time you download this presentation, it'll be out of date. Um, you may never download it, but if I do it next year again, it'll be out of date by then. Okay. There's no limit to the new functionality that will happen. We're just not seeing any slowdown in any of it. The protocols are getting better, the networks are getting better, the computers are getting better, the software is getting better. So we expect to see massive changes in the industry. That said, here's the biggest problem. Security. I hearken back to this. This is my final, uh, final slide here. This is the 600-pound gorilla, or for us Canadians, it's the 272.155 kilogram gorilla. <coughs> we never say that, by the way. Yeah, we always round up. It's uh, a point of connectivity. You add a point of connectivity in, and you will have created some sort of a security hole. So it's absolutely essential that you understand what hole you're creating and how you can potentially backfill it. Okay, my construction site's coming out now. Uh, the proper networking and understanding the proper networking for it is essential. And the components becoming hardened. We're seeing a lot of new components have things like built-in firewalls, encryption right in the device, uh, OPC servers that have encryption right on it, OPC UA with certificates on them. Um, and at the bottom, I wanted to point out a few things that I've heard over the last year. Uh, absolutely amazed me in 2019. Those of you, any of you from Texas will know, 22 of our utilities got hit by ransomware and a number of them paid out. Um, I think there may be 23, but 22 of them have said they were hit. I know of one in particular that got hit be that was not part of that 22 in 2018, they were hit and they lost absolutely everything, had to be rebuild all of their computers from scratch. Even redundancy doesn't help you there. Okay, So if you take two computers and you have exactly the same thing running on both computers, uh, if one gets hit and gets ransomware, that same ransomware um, kernel or program can quickly spread to your other computer. Also do the same thing there. If you back it up, it can spread over there and encrypt your backup. So unless you take that backup and take it offline completely, physically, then it can get to it. Anyway, sorry, did I? 
Yeah, that's, that's what I hear. They paid up and got all their stuff back, but it was not cheap. Okay. Thankfully, they already know exactly how much money you have. So they just tell you exactly how much to pay and you're good to go. Um, one company reported uh, averaging one million attacks per day, hacking attacks per day. Okay, that sounds like a lot. Most of them are just like uh, nothing and uh, you know, denial of service type attacks, junk that the systems are ready, relatively ready to go against it all day long. But that does mean that there's all day long the system is just knocking out these attacks. Unless you have even the basic, if you don't have even the basic kind of uh, protection on your system, you will be hacked. Um, and then one VT SCADA SI told me a couple of weeks ago that they were ransomware. As it turned out, they had uh, had an entire backup system that had been given to the or synchronized with the Amazon cloud, and the Amazon cloud protects itself against ransomware by physically moving the data off on a disconnected uh, area. <coughs> so they ran. They ended up with. Uh, I won't tell you who it is, but they did get all of their business computers, all their VT SCADA computers internally were uh, encrypted, as was the cloud portion that replicated their stuff, but the, the off-site backup or the air-gapped backup was fine, so they just recreated all their computers from there, so just something to keep in mind. Kay. So there you go. That's what I have to offer. I wanted to thank you all very much for attending. I got one more slide that seems to say the skate life cycle, but it's not coming up, so I'm done. So <laughs> thank you very much. If there's any questions, feel free. Uh, Michael will give, um, give you the baton there, and you can talk into that. <coughs> so earlier you mentioned uh, IoT devices or IIoT. Correct. Uh, yeah. First of all, what's that second I? And ah, industrial Internet of Things. Industrial, okay. Yeah. A and those sensors, what types of sensors are we looking at, and what is their backhaul to, is it going back to the SCADA system or back to an RTU? So uh, those devices are, uh, so what type of devices? They're all kinds of different type of devices. They could be smart devices themselves, which have the uh, cellular device built right into the transceiver, or it could be a uh, device that's picking up a bunch of pieces of information from a field area and then uh, concentrating that and sending it back. Now that data transfer is through, uh, through a cloud type application. So IIoT protocols go to what's called a broker. The broker then determines who's supposed to receive the information as they're called the subscribers. And the subscribers then will get that info. We can be a subscriber, we can install a kernel, it's called Mosquito, uh, program on our servers and we can receive that information directly. But in a lot of cases it goes to uh, a cloud somewhere and then that data is made available beyond that. Is that the MQTT Correct, MQTT. So there's several different variants of MQTT that uh, we hear about uh, and they're, I don't know what the term is, what's the general term for those type things? Um, the I'm talking to you. Uh, no, the, the XML, the JSON, the Sparkplug B, what are those terms called? <coughs> so MQTT is basically a framework. It defines how data gets sent around. It's a transport mechanism. And then internally, it has a data, um, right. it has a payload. The yeah. Hey, Blair, isn't uh, Pete doing a, uh, a seminar on MQTT? I think, I think Probably, he is. yeah. Yeah, so that's a good one to, to check Do you know what time that is? Uh, I'll tell you in a second here. Okay. It's, yeah, what's... You gotta leave? Uh, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, it's, a, it's from two to three. So two to three, okay. Yeah, that's a really good And one I've got one from one to two and three to four, yeah. so yeah, you can watch it in between. Kyle's got one here. <coughs> um, Blair, you mentioned hey, that there's a facility in North Texas that was looking to have, uh, you know, HMIs out at every panel. Um, is there a fundamental difference between the nomenclature for an HMI or an OIT on panels? There is not. I, I, I see it all it's the time. It's a very generic people, term. There's no delineation between. Not at all. It's okay. all incredibly confusing, and it depends on who you're <laughs> talking to and what industry you're talking to. Right. Yeah, that changes drastically. If uh, I'm talking to certain people, they'll call that a SCADA node. 
Yeah. So it all depends okay. on. I was always curious if there was a an official industry definition between the two. It's Im officially <laughs> ambiguous. Yeah, it's actually kind of weird because a lot of people will call SCADA software HMI software, so it, it does get confusing. It does. So I got a question. How many people here know what IoT is? Because a lot of folks, we've been talking about that for five, six, seven years to yep. some folks, and, you know, I've talked to... Well, you got to let them know now. Well, I, 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 You can't just leave no, this question hanging. You. Well, IoT is the Internet of Things, and essentially <clears throat> we had the Internet which is for all the people. Now we've got the Internet of Things. It started, I think that term was coined back in like 1999, but the idea is that it's sensors on all these things that are actually talking to each other. So what we're seeing in, in uh, SCADA systems and things like that is that all because they're talking to each other, they're actually going to be able to be smarter. They do things for you. You don't have to do it. And it's, it's across everything. So yeah, we're just different than OIT. Absolutely. Cyberdyne is uh, the Terminator. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. And then, and that's exactly <laughs> it. So basically, you might want to mark that down that we've got, I don't know what, eight, ten years to till the Terminator comes to out. To live. I'll be yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. My arms. I have not got stuff. a clue what that all means. Well, when you're talking yeah. like the industrial Internet of Things, they've got it's basically classifications for different, so you start with the internet, you know, 1.0, and then the internet of things, 2.0, you start having these devices with sensors, and then, you know, the next phase would be you know, 3.0, where these devices are all talking to each other. There's no human interaction. Um, okay. and what is 4.0? Because that's what I'm hearing now, industry 4.0. That's, uh, that's like machine learning. <coughs> so oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Automation, there you go, automated vehicles and such. All well, right. there is there's an interesting uh, example of that. I'm, I'm from Ohio, and uh, Cincinnati MSD uh, are just working with a company that they have some IoT devices that is across. They've got like 600 of these that are out in their distribution system, and it's bringing back information that they've never been able to get, and it's allowing them to do things that they've never been able to do and really save them tons and tons of money. So kind of an interesting ap application. Yeah. Um one last note, en energy transfer, I was speaking to those guys, big pipeline manufacturer, and actually their guys are here. Um, they're bringing in currently two million points, two million individual points, uh, various times per day, and uh, all IoT information. They're gonna ramp that up to four million this year. So um, I'd hate to be the person going through it, but thus the need for your 4.0 automated machine learning so you could do something valuable with that rather than hiring an army of people to go through boring records all day. But yeah, so it's on a big pipeline, I'm sure there's an extremely, val uh, extremely good value in pulling in those kind of uh, levels of records using these devices that you don't have to have an RTU for or a PLC. Anyway, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. And especially on a Friday morning after having gone out last night. <laughs> yeah, nice. Nice job.